Good morning. My name is Charles Forsberg from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And today I would like to discuss nuclear energy drop-in replacements for gas turbines, natural gas, and fossil liquid fuels. My co-authors are Bruce Dale from Michigan State University and Eric Ingersoll from Lucid Catalyst. We have conducted a series of studies to understand how to replace fossil fuels with nuclear energy. And these are summarized on the following figure. We show that the energy flows in the United States with energy sources on the left in different colors and energy consumers on the right in pink, the residential, commercial, industrial, and transport sectors. And what we would like to discuss is replacing three parts of that energy diagram with nuclear energy. The first part is the electric sector where we replace gas turbines using nuclear energy with heat storage. The second part is natural gas, where we replace natural gas with nuclear hydrogen. The third part is where we, we replace oil with nuclear biofuels. With that introduction, let us take a look at these three sectors and what nuclear energy can contribute. First, let's discuss replacing the gas turbine that is providing variable electricity by coupling heat storage to nuclear reactors. We have a series of workshops and of papers available uh, if you have an interest. Now, electricity markets are changing. Electricity prices in fossil fuel systems are relatively constant because most of the production costs is in the fuel. And this is seen in the right, which shows the price of electricity over 24 hours in California. Now in 2012, the system was dominated by fossil fuels and the price curve is shown in red, which is relatively flat except for an evening peak. By 2017, California had added large quantities of photovoltaic, which changed the price curve to the blue curve where we have a peak in the morning, a peak in the evening and negative or near zero prices in the middle of the day when the sun is out. In short, large scale wind or solar creates volatile electric prices. And in that new system, what is required is that we need a replacement for the gas turbine to provide variable power when required by the grid. This implies a need to rethink nuclear power with heat storage for baseload reactors with variable electricity to the grid. In the middle of this picture, we show heat storage, a hot storage tank and a cold storage tank filled with either oil or nitrate salts. To the left, we have the reactor. The reactor operates at base load. It takes the cold fluid, heats it, and puts it into the hot storage tank. To the right, in yellow, we have the power block. It takes hot fluid, produces variable electricity, returning cold fluid to the cold storage tank. The power block peak output is two to four times the average power output of the reactor and is designed for variable electricity output. In addition to all of this, we have the option of taking cold fluid and heating it up to high temperatures and putting it into the hot storage tank using electricity and the prices of electricity are low. Now, this strategy, this approach is similar to heat storage at concentrated solar plants. I show one storage facility, one solar power tower here. If you look at the lower right, you see the power block with a hot and cold nitrate storage tanks. Same basic system. Now, nuclear energy with large scale heat storage is competitive in a low carbon electric grid. First, we have a baseload reactor to minimize cost of heat production. Second, heat storage enables variable electricity to maximize revenue and replace gas turbines. It is much less expensive than storing electricity. The reasons are fairly obvious. Uh, the capital costs of existing heat storage systems are about $70 per kilowatt hour. The capital costs of advanced heat storage systems are projected to be potentially as low as $10 a kilowatt hour. In contrast, the long-term battery cost goals are $200 per kilowatt hour, and that cost is controlled by the cost of raw materials. In short, heat storage is less expensive than electricity storage. Multiple advanced reactors propose using nitrate salt intermediate loops with heat storage. This shows the uh, GE TerraPower system in the picture. Way in the back is the power block. 
in front of the power block, you see the hot and cold nitrate storage tanks. And at the front, you see the actual reactor. It's a different site layout with a different set of requirements for the power station. With that, let us turn to the second subject, replacing natural gas with nuclear hydrogen, or as I would like to put it, gas transition two. Starting in the 1800s, many large cities built town gas facilities to produce town gas, which is a mixture of carbon monoxide and hydrogen used for heating, lights, and cooking. Now, in the 1950s, with the introduction of natural gas, natural gas replaced town gas in the United States. That occurred later in Europe in the 1970s. What we're now talking about is a second gas transition from natural gas to hydrogen, something we actually know how to do. And again, we of course have reports for those of you who are interested in the details. Now, hydrogen can replace natural gas. Uh, currently the US consumes 10 million tons of uh, hydrogen per year to make fertilizer, chemical, chemicals, and oil refining. Hydrogen shipped by pipeline and stored in underground facilities like natural gas. And last, particularly important for this discussion, can ship massive quantities of hydrogen by a single pipeline. Now, electricity power line capacities are typically one to two gigawatts. A large pipeline capacity is measured in tens of gigawatts, order of magnitude larger. And that has some potentially very large implications. The ability to transport tens of gigawatts of hydrogen from a site enables a nuclear gigafactory where we have factory fabrication of the reactors. We show the picture on the right. We have factory fabrication of the reactors and as shown at the back of the picture, the reactors are deployed next to the factory as shown in the middle of the picture and the hydrogen plant is next to the reactors. We go to a factory building model to lower capital costs dramatically. Now, this implies energy production at the scale of an integrated oil refinery, much larger than a conventional power station. The second factor we must understand is that hydrogen electrolysis plants have high capital costs that favors nuclear hydrogen production. The figure at the right shows the cost of hydrogen versus the capacity of the hydrogen plant. And as you can see, you need high capacity factors for low cost hydrogen. Now that makes capacity factors of the heat and Electricity source, uh, the driving factor in hydrogen costs. Nuclear has 90% capacity factors versus solar at about 25%. And that difference in capacity factors implies that nuclear can provide cheaper hydrogen than solar. With that, let's turn to the last subject, replacing liquid fossil fuels with nuclear biofuels. Again, we have a series of papers and an ongoing workshop for those of you who are interested in additional details. Now, uh, the existing fossil fuel system produced liquid hydrocarbons and feedstocks as shown herein. We start with crude oil, widely variable composition, lots of impurities. We send it through something called an oil refinery, a very complicated, very large chemical plant to produce hydrocarbon fuels, that is gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, and chemical feedstock. That is the existing system. What we are proposing is switching feedstocks from crude oil to biomass carbon and eliminate additions to the atmosphere. As shown in this figure, we have our biomass, a mixture of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. We send it to a nuclear biorefinery where we add massive quantities of heat and hydrogen to produce liquid hydrocarbon fuels that go to cars, trucks, and airplanes. The fuels are burnt, the carbon dioxide goes to the atmosphere and recycled back to the biomass system to produce additional fuels. At the biorefinery site, we do have the option to produce and separate out carbon dioxide for low cost carbon sequestration if there is an interest or a market for that service. Now, in terms of biomass processing, we have two choices. The existing choice is shown in the top line. We start with biomass, we add oxygen to produce hydrocarbons and carbon dioxide. Now, the carbon is used to make hydrocarbon fuels, gasoline, diesel, jet fuel. 
the carbon is, is also oxidized, some of the carbon is also oxidized to remove oxygen from the biomass and provide energy for the process. What we propose is the bottom equation. Start with biomass, add massive quantities of hydrogen, massive quantities of nuclear heat to produce hydrocarbons and water. Now that has many implications. Uh, external hydrogen and heat doubles the energy of hydrocarbon fuel per unit feedstock. And it enables the use of low value, high carbon content biomass feedstocks to produce hydrocarbon fuels. What we do not do is we do not use carbon as an energy source. We do not use carbon as a way to remove oxygen from the biomass. Now, nuclear biofuels can replace oil without major impacts on food and fiber, much to the surprise of many people. Historically, biomass has been viewed as an energy source, that is bioenergy. Nuclear biofuels views biomass as a carbon source, including low energy content biomass, kelp, double crops, sewage sludge. Implication, external heat and hydrogen inputs multiply the energy value of hydrocarbon fuel per ton of biomass input, thus reducing biomass feedstock requirements. Now, there's some other requirements for a nuclear biofuel facility. Economics requires massive biorefineries. Let me use an example of one particular process. Uh, today, Fisher Tropes is used to convert natural gas and coal into synthetic crude oil, as shown in the picture on the right. We can also use the same process to convert biomass into a synthetic crude oil that couples to an oil refinery. However, all of the options require massive scale, 250,000 barrels per day to be economically viable. Well, what are the implications of large biorefineries? <laughs> the first one is fairly clear. Uh, require gigawatts heat sources that can only be provided by nuclear or fossil fuels with carbon capture and sequestration. The second is that we require massive amounts of biomass feedstocks per biorefinery, or about six, 60,000 tons per biorefinery. Now, the problem is, is that low density biomass can be economically shipped only 30 to 50 miles, and there's insufficient biomass to support such a nuclear biorefinery. Implication, you require depots to consolidate biomass near the farm or forest into economically shippable biomass products. That leads to the following nuclear biofuel system that includes biomass, the depot, and the refinery. On the left, we have the biomass that is shipped by truck to the depots. There are different depot options depending upon the type of biomass. The first option is to pelletize into a dense storable form and ship by unit train. The second depot option is anaerobic digestion, uh, which yields a mixture of, car of carbon dioxide and methane that is shipped via pipeline to the biorefinery. The third option is pyrolysis that creates a pyrolysis oil that is shipped by pipeline or unit train to the biorefinery. At the biorefinery, massive inputs of heat and hydrogen from co-located nuclear power plants to produce gasoline, jet fuel, diesel, chemical feedstocks, and the option of sequestered carbon dioxide. Conclusions. We are developing a low carbon nuclear energy strategy for the three major energy sectors of the United States. For the electric sector in gold, we want nuclear power with stored heat for variable electricity. For natural gas, we propose replacing with nuclear hydrogen. And for oil, we propose replacing with nuclear biofuels. With that, I will stop and open the floor to any questions. And again, if you have any want any of the documents, please feel free to contact the authors and we will provide you some of the backup documentation. Thank you very much.